Welcome everyone to the second artist talk of the day. Um, I'm Sheetal Majithia, I'm a professor at NYU Abu Dhabi in the literature and creative writing. I'm very excited to have this discussion with um, Omar al Qaeda. I also want to uh, thank Georgetown University Qatar and um, CIRS and all of the organizers and conveners of this really fantastic conference. Thank you for having us. Um, so Omar really doesn't need an introduction, but I will provide one. Um, Omar al Khad is an author and journalist. The start of his journalism career coincided with the start of the war on terror. And over the following decade, he reported from Afghanistan, Guantanamo Bay, and many other locations around the world. His work earned a National Newspaper Award for Investigative Journalism and the Goff Penny Award for Young Journalists. His fiction and nonfiction writing has appeared in the New York Times, The Guardian, Le Monde, uh, Guernica, GQ, and many other newspapers and magazines. His debut novel, American War, is an international bestseller and has been translated into 13 languages. His new novel, What Strange Paradise, was released in July 2021 uh, and was named a best book of the year by the New York Times, the Washington Post, NPR, and several other publications. Um, I should also add that American War was selected by the BBC as one of um, the 100 novels that changed our world. So we're really, really excited to be able to talk with um, Omar. Um, okay, so I was just going to sort of initiate the discussion and then we'll have um, a Q&A with Omar. Um, so for folks who maybe haven't read your works, um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about them and also their relationship to each other. Um, I know that in uh, the Canada Reads 2018 book trailer for American War, the last line of this trailer is, if it had been you, you you'd have done no different. Very intriguing. Um, and then What Strange Paradise you talked about as um, the, Patter, the Peter Pan story, but inverted from the pers uh, inverted to tell the story from the perspective of a refugee child. So, yeah, if you could just tell us about the novels, how they're related. Um, first of all, thank you so much for doing this. I know this is thankless work, and I appreciate it. Um, thank you all for for coming out to this. Uh, means a lot. I um, just a quick quick show of hands uh, of those of you who live here. How many? Uh, have been living here since before 2000. Okay, I feel old as hell now. Thank you. That's um, so. I, I grew up here. Uh, I came here in the mid 80s, and I left in the late 90s. And um, I showed up. I showed up here for this conference around midnight last night, and I was jet lagged to all hell. And so I, I knew I wasn't going to fall asleep. So I decided to go for a walk, and I walked down the Corniche. Uh, down to Doha Sheraton, where my dad used to work as an accountant. And for those of you who were here before, before 2000, that was really the only game in town as far as hotels went, right? Like, there was, like, the Gulf Sheraton or the Ramada, but those places suck. They don't. No offense. I don't know. I don't even know if they're still around. doesn't matter. Anyway, so at 5 a.m. yesterday, if you happened to be walking through the lobby of the Doha Sheraton, there was a 41-year-old man getting weepy for no discernible reason, and that was me, because I hadn't been back. I haven't been back in almost 20 years now. Um, so most of the country is unrecognizable to me, except like little dots of, of memory uh, of where I grew up, which is all to say it's a pleasure to be back. Um, so for those of you who are unfamiliar with my work, uh, I specialize in stone cold bummers, just <laughs> incredibly depressing. If you want to have your day ruined, uh, you can try either of my novels. Uh, if you don't have that kind of time, you can try any of the short stories. Um, or you can just come talk to me. My personality has the same effect. Uh, to give you a sense of what I'm talking about, um, American War, which was translated into a bunch of languages, uh, a few years ago, somebody, a publisher in China bought the Chinese rights. And I didn't know much about what they were going to do. All I knew was that they didn't like the title, American War. They were going to change it into something. 
What the hell were they going to change it to? I had no idea. Fast forward six months later, um, I get a copy of the, of the Chinese edition of American War. I have no idea what the cover says. So I go to my friend who speaks the language and I say, hey, what does this title say? And he looks at it and he says, oh, it says nobody survives. <laughs> so spoiler alert, if you haven't read American <laughs> War. <laughs> uh, so I, I've, I've published two books. I've published a book called American War and another one called What Strange Paradise. American War was the first one. It was published in 2017. And it is the story of a second American Civil War that takes place. Sorry, every time I turn to look at you, I get way louder. So I'm going to try and modulate for that. Um, it's, it takes place in the 2070s uh, after a second American Civil War. Um, the US of the 2070s is a very different place in many respects, one of them geographically. Uh, the eastern seaboard is underwater. Florida is underwater. The capital has been moved to Columbus, Ohio. Hundreds of millions of people have fled the storms and the rising seas. And long after it would do any good at all, the federal government decides to outlaw fossil fuels. By this point in time, everybody has moved on to other sources of energy. Nonetheless, a number of southern states decide that they would rather secede than go along with this. What follows is a second civil war. Uh, the South loses again. And then the story takes place in the years following the war, these years of insurgency. And it follows a single family and what those years do to them. Um, one of the fun things you get to do when you're, when you're a published author is pretend that there was a very clean genesis story of how the book came about. You know, this happened, this happened, then I wrote a book. Uh, in reality, it's much messier than that. But the closest thing I have to a kind of genesis story for American War is um, many, many years ago when I was working, I was still working as a journalist in the early years of the NATO invasion of, of Afghanistan. Um, I was watching this interview I think it was on CNN, but I honestly don't remember. And it was an interview with a foreign affairs think tank guy from DC. And it was happening the day after these protests in Afghanistan. Villagers were protesting against the US military presence. And the question that was put to this gentleman was something like, why do they hate us so much? And as part of his answer, he said, well, you know, sometimes the special forces have to go into these villages and conduct nighttime raids looking for insurgents. And when they do this, They'll sometimes ransack the houses or hold the women and children at gunpoint. And then he very helpfully added, and you know, in Afghan culture, that sort of thing is considered very offensive. <laughs> and I thought, you know, name me one culture on earth that would, like, if you did this in Sweden, would you be celebrated? And that's when I thought about this idea of taking the conflicts that have defined the world in my lifetime, so basically, you know, 40, for the past 40 years, and these are conflicts in which Western involvement generally, but US involvement specifically, has been either from a great distance or sort of indirect, and to recast it as close to home as I could think of. And the closest to home I could think of was the Civil War, where you're fighting yourself. The idea being to talk about this notion that there's no such thing as an exotic kind of suffering, that those people all the way over there are not behaving in some fundamentally alien way to being on the receiving ends of the bullets and the bombs. That was the idea. Uh, the book, I finished the first draft, and then three weeks later, Donald Trump announced he was running for president. The book ends up coming, in April, coming out in April of 2017, which is four months into the Trump administration. And this book that I thought of as not an American book at all, as an overlaying of somebody else's story onto the empire, is read overwhelmingly as an American book. It's, it's a literal prediction of how a second civil war would go down, and that was great for my royalty statement. I sold a ton more copies as a result, but, um, but the book I wrote and the book that's being read, particularly in the West, those are two entirely different books. And then the second novel is What Strange Paradise. It's a reinterpreted fable, uh, the story of Peter Pan reinterpreted as a story of uh, contemporary child refugee. Um, that came out in 2021. There was almost no interest in it at all in the West, uh, and then it and got a good review in the Times, and it won this award, and it sort of saved my career in that sense. But it was very much a case of um, trying to take a comforting fairy tale that Westerners have been telling their kids for the last hundred years and repurposing it to tell a different kind of story about a group of people that, if you live in the West, you can not give a damn about with relative impunity. Um, so yeah, stone cold bummers. Um, both Since you brought that up, maybe we will talk a little bit more about dystopia. Um, 
why are you drawn to that as a genre and, um, or as a mode? Um, and I bring this up because I'm a big fan of dystopia, but there's a lot of them, a, a kind of backlash against um, dystopic takes on the future because um, what's suggested is that these kinds of things discourage people from engaging in action and, and people don't want to do anything. Um, I have a different perspective. I think that they're very, like, very galvanizing and I was just wondering like, why, why do you like the bummers <laughs> so much? Um, and is there some strategic thing that it offers you? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to think about it from the perspective of, of causing change, right? Because I don't, I don't think of that as an obligation of the writer. Um, and other writers disagree with me vehemently. Mm -hmm. And I think even I might disagree with me on, on some level, that when I, when I write these things, I'm secretly hoping that I am going to change people's perspectives or, or outlooks or something in that regard. Um, but I can't have that be an overt obligation when I'm writing. Um, because then the thing I'm trying to do, the mission statement changes in a way that I'm not comfortable with. Also, I'm not good at it. Um, a few years ago, this professor who, who studies climate, like cli-fi, they call it, the mm -hmm. sort of climate fiction, reached out to me because he was doing a study on whether um, stories can help change people's views of climate change and action around climate change. And he was like, hey, can you write, can you write a short story? It just has to be cli-fi themed. I'm not going to tell you anything else. And we just want to interpret whether, um, you know, we're going to make people read it and we're going to interpret the change in their perspectives. And so I wrote him this story and I shipped it off to him and emailed back saying, this is so depressing, we can't use this, I'm sorry. <laughs> so it was never part of the study. Um, so I don't, know, I don't know what happened with that and whether cli-fi can actually change people's views or not. Um, I, the writers who live in my pantheon, um, Toni Morrison, uh, James Agee, Naguib Mahfouz, uh, these people, they're, they're of a talent level where I will read their writing on anything. I'll go back and read A.G.'s film reviews. I don't care what he thought about those films. He's just an incredible writer. I'm not in that place. I don't have that kind of talent. I need to write about the thing that feels most necessary at any given moment. And what feels necessary for me is the stuff that makes me angry. And the things that make me angry are systemic rather than individual. I'm obsessed with fraudulent systems. I'm obsessed with unjust systems. The problem with that when I'm writing is that Anger is a form of heat, and it gets away from me. And so you can see the scorch marks on the page. You can see where it got away from me. I'm not, I'm not James Baldwin. Baldwin had that talent to take something he was very, very angry about and control it on the page in a way that comes out very, very profound. I don't have that talent. I'm trying for it, but I miss. Um, and that's interesting in its own way, but I... I'm not interested in, in hope as, as epilogue. For me, particularly living in a place like the US, I get this question a lot about why the books don't resolve in a way that is, that is more satisfying. And, and, and I think hope as epilogue is a real privilege. This idea that no matter how much we screw things up, at the end it's gonna work out because every movie I've ever watched has taught me to believe that it's always gonna, that's not useful to me. Hope is prologue is incredibly mm -hmm. useful to me. Hope as a starting point to then go and do something is important to me. Uh, and that's generally how the books are framed. Um, but that doesn't work for all people. I can tell you that when we were selling the film rights for American War, at least three production companies walked away because I asked them to keep the story the way it is and not Disneyfy it and sort of, you know, that ending drove away, like, it cost me a bunch of money too. Um, but they were, the, the idea that it, that it doesn't all resolve itself at the end in the most satisfying way is just incompatible with people's view of, certain people's view of culture, but not mine. And so it doesn't, doesn't bother me as much. So can we look forward to a film adaptation of it? Oh God, no. no these things <laughs> never get made. We just resold it like two weeks ago. Um, and what they do is they buy the option, which means they get to put a reserved sign on your book. Nobody else can make a movie out of it. And I get a few thousand bucks which for me is great, like I'm broke all of the time, that's fantastic. But if they make the movie, if it's called Exercising the Option, which is the first day the cameras roll, I get something like a quarter million dollars, like ludicrous sums of money. 
but 95% of options never get exercised. And so I've learned over the last five years that I just have this lottery ticket in my pocket and it's almost certainly not gonna pay off. Um, so I was really interested in the way that you talked about writing in terms of heat, which is also a form of energy. And I think um, one of the things that this conference has been devoted to and we've been talking about is sort of the ways in which um, arts and humanities can make us attentive to the multiple scales of how energy structures our world. Um, and not only to bring nuance, but to bring all of those scales together. And I think that that's exactly what you were talking about when you talked about sort of a kind of energy that goes into your work, and then your work is also about energy. So I was wondering if you could relate those things and talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, with American War, when I started writing that, I was still working full time as a journalist. I had a day job. And um, I had, at one point, I had, I had sort of the, the rough idea of what I wanted to write about. I had basically a thesis statement, this idea about there being no, no such thing as a foreign kind of suffering. The problem is that a novel that's just a thesis statement is a really boring novel, right? It's not, it doesn't work. And I, I had a bit of a narrative, but I had no idea where I was going to start the story. And then for months, I had been bugging the foreign editor at my paper. So my paper was based in Canada. It was the Globe and Mail, which was the national paper up in Canada. And I'd been bugging the foreign editor to let me go do a story from southern Louisiana. Um, if you've never been to Louisiana, it's one of the most beautiful places on earth, uh, culturally, geographically, um, stunning, stunning landscape. It's also disappearing into the Gulf of Mexico mm -hmm. at the rate of about a football field of land every hour. Uh, it's one of the worst climate disasters on Earth. Um, there's a whole bunch of reasons for this. There's rising sea levels, uh, salt water intrusion. So the salt water gets in and kills the root systems of the plants that are holding the land together, which makes it easier for the land to slip into the Gulf of Mexico. Um, hundreds and hundreds of miles of oil and gas pipelines, um, some of which are so old that they don't know where they are. They have no mapping of these things. They're just quietly dripping away somewhere. Um, and it, it's, it was interesting to me because I was thinking about this book that's so concerned with things the US has done to the world. And here I was in a place where the world was doing something to the US, right? And since I'm a one trick pony and I do a lot of inversion, this inversion was really sort of interesting to me. Um, but the parishes in southernmost Louisiana, which are quite literally disappearing, they're, they're, they're fading into the water, would also be, were it not for these industries, some of the poorest places, not just in the United States, but in the Western Hemisphere. Mm -hmm. And so you have people who live there, they're not stupid, they can see what's happening to their land. They're also keenly aware that they would have no financial power, no, no political power, that they would be completely ignored were it not for this industry that is indirectly, in some cases, very directly responsible for what is happening. Um, and so that conflict to me was, was really, really interesting because the thing that is driving, the natural forces that are driving it, could care less about borders, about the nation state, about the US GDP that year. It doesn't matter in the slightest which is going to be the case with the central crisis of the century, right? We have, we have this thing happening that does not care in the slightest where one country starts and the other one ends. Um, and once I was in that place, I knew that the story had to start there and American War kind of flowed from that one assignment in, in southern Louisiana. And it very much shifted my view of the relationship between literature, which is the act of saying something about what it means to be human and energy how we run this world. Um, and it started my shift of thinking not only about Exodus as someone being driven from their land, but Exodus as the land being driven from someone. Mm -hmm. And that sort of mm -hmm. altered a lot of my writing since. So that's actually a great segue for my last question, um, which is about place. Sorry, I rambled so much that you no, only got through three I, that's, questions. That's okay. That is, that's, a that's a personal best for me. All right. That's perfect. <laughs> Um, so it's really, really interesting that the um, focus on energy started with a place. Um, we've been talking a lot about um, how um, place determines very much like our understanding of 
energy and this idea that this like place is disappearing. And I wanted to relate that to, I mean, just the role of place in general in your work, but also this really um, haunting formulation that you introduced. Um, and I think this was from your experience reporting on Guantanamo. Um, and the detainees that you met who I think were called forever prisoners. And then you describe the detention sites as forever places. Um, uh, so like these detention centers that don't exist anywhere on US soil, nor do US laws acknowledge these people. Um, and you describe them as if they're immune to time. And so, it's, and it's really fascinating because I feel like with Louisiana and even with this, you're kind of saying like these non-places are really, are necessary. They're necessary for energy empires to persist. And so, you know, what does that mean for us? And yeah, if you could just talk a little bit about these non-places. Yeah, so, so Gitmo, the Guantanamo Bay detention camps were, were this thing that like a lot of the post 9-11 sort of infrastructure people were making up as they went along. So if you look at the, the original photos of the Guantanamo Bay detention facility, it's these things that look like oversized dog kennels, you know, and they got people in orange jumpsuits in them. That's called Camp X-Ray. And Camp X-Ray was this thing that the folks at Gitmo, which was just this like sleepy marine base that nobody cared about for the longest time. They had to build these things in a hurry because they got a call that some planes were coming over. And since that time, they, we actually, when we went there in 2008, the reason I went in 2008 was because there was one Westerner left in, in Guantanamo Bay. It was this kid named Omar Khadr. Omar Khadr was captured in Afghanistan after a firefight, and he was accused of murdering a special forces medic. And he spent the better part of 10 years. He was 15 when they caught him. And he spent the better part of 10 years in Gitmo. And because he was a Canadian citizen, my Canadian newspaper gave a damn about Guantanamo. As soon as he was gone, they, they stopped caring. But we, we were coming down there in 2008, and by then, Camp X-Ray was abandoned, and the US military wanted nothing more than to tear this thing down because it was embarrassing to them. They couldn't because it could have been used as evidence in future court cases. And so when we went and toured this place, it looks like something out of a horror movie. It's like these mesh wire things, and, and the weeds are overgrowing them, and there's dilapidate, dilapidated, um, sheds, the interrogation sheds, where they used to interrogate these guys, and they're falling apart, um, but they can't touch them. And so it's this weird Kafka-esque place. But we're there, and one, one of my defining memories of this place was we were touring Camp 4. So there used to be Camp 1, 2, and 3. A bunch of people killed themselves in 1, 2, and 3. They built 4, 5, and 6. 5 and 6 are supermax facilities, which means you're, you're kept in a cell that's about the width of our two chairs here for 23 and a half hours a day. Um, in solitary, obviously, no, no contact with anybody else. Four was a medium security. And they, they let us tour the medium security. And we're walking around, and at one point I ask the officer who's giving us the tour, I ask him this question, and I say, so when do the prisoners, and as soon as I get to that word prisoners, one of the soldiers interrupts me and says, we don't have prisoners here, sir, we have detainees. It was very, very important to the entire endeavor and to this man's sense of where he belonged in that endeavor, that there be no prisoners. Because a prisoner implies a prison sentence which somebody has to define. A judge has to say at some point, you are sentenced to X, Y. A detainee you can hold forever. And this was a recurring aspect of what it was like to be in a place like Guantanamo, which is a place designed not to exist. It is neither Cuba nor is it the US. Mm -hmm. On one of our flights back, for some reason, they decided to make us fill out customs cards. I have no idea why. One of the things they ask you on US customs cards is where are you coming from? And this was back before ties were, were sort of loosened up with Cuba. You weren't allowed to be in Cuba if you were a US citizen or if you're coming from the US. And so I, I ask the, the Department of Defense guy, I'm like, what do I write here? Because if I write Cuba, I'm getting in trouble. If I'm writing the US, why am I filling out a customs card? And he was like, it doesn't matter. I don't care where <laughs> nobody's going to read these. It's designed to be nowhere. And I, w I was fairly young when I did this. I was in my 20s. And, and I had this impression that warfare was just the layer of physical violence. It was the bombs going off and the bullets and, and the sort of the thing 
that you most associate with wartime. But that can't exist in a vacuum. It needs other layers of violence to hold it up. And one of those is linguistic violence. You see this right now, right? This notion of the passive language. There, there are all kinds of buildings in Gaza that are just going up in flames, right? There are people who are, just happen to no longer be alive. You know, the passive language is a huge part of that. Euphemism is a huge part of that. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as we accidentally bombed a wedding party, sorry. There's collateral damage. There's mm -hmm. sort of this very sanitizing language, which was really fascinating about this place because I'm in the business of at least trying to do the exact opposite of that, right? And for this entire deeply fraudulent enterprise to exist, it needs to do what I consider to be anti-literature. <laughs> It needs to exist within the scope of fraudulent language. And so Guantanamo was a huge influence on me for a variety of reasons. One of them being that it was an entire system designed to sort of kid itself about what it actually was. And it was fairly successful in that regard. And it continues to exist even though nobody gives a damn about it now. Um, and a lot of that language and a lot of the things that were perfected in those early years in Gitmo have now become part of not just the US mainstream political discourse, but the Western political discourse. Mm -hmm. It was seen that this stuff works, so you can go do it. And to see it firsthand in a place like Gitmo, where people's lives are actively being destroyed in front of you, um, was again a sort of reorienting experience. Thank you so much for this riveting conversation. I'm sure folks will um, be crowding you now also to talk about it more. Thank you so much. Thank you.